Thank you. And uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers to give me the occasion to speak here, which is kind of a student dream. And so today I will speak about modeling limits, which is uh, related to the notion of limit of structures. <coughs> and uh, there are many kinds of notions of limit of structures. And so I will first very briefly uh, recall two notions that are kind of classical by now in, uh, in graph theory, left limits and, uh, and local limits. The first one, uh, the notion of left limits has been introduced by uh, Lovas uh, and uh, many others. And, uh, and it's based on the, on the following idea. When you consider a sequence of graphs Gn, you randomly pick p random points and you look at what they induce. And what you would like is that uh, you say that the, the sequence is, uh, is convergent if when n go to infinity, the probability that p vertices will induce something uh, given, so like uh, uh, a given graph f, this probability should converge. So this notion of limit is inherently based on the notion of sampling. You sample points and you look, you sample randomly points in your graph, independently and uniformly, and you look at what they induce. And the limit, when, uh, the limit object that you can give when you have a, a convergent sequence can be of two, for, two different forms. A first form is, uh, is a distribution on some spatial space. It is a space of, uh, of um, uh, countable graphs uh, on integers. And the limit can be represented as a distribution on this space, which has a property to be invariant by some uh, action of the infinite permutation group. I will not go into the details. And the second possibility to represent the limit object is by means of an analytic object, which is a graphon. And a graphon is a measurable function from the square to 0, 1, which is symmetric. And you can think about this graphon as a way to generate a random graph which is close to the limit. So when you have a, ra uh, when you have a graphon, this is your graphon somehow, you have, so it's a 0, 1 square, and at each point you have some value between 0 and 1, and you want to generate a random graph you simply consider random values. So you pick randomly, say, n values independently and uniformly in the interval 0, 1. So you have the same here, same values. And once this will be your vertex set, and then for i and j, for x, i, and j, you look at this number, which is between 0 and 1, and you roll a dice, and with the probability indicated here, you will put an edge between vertex i and j. And the graph that you obtain with i probability, and asymptotically, when n will go to infinity, will be closer and closer to your limit. So this is kind of interpretation of what a graphon is. So in a probabilistic point of view, this is like a, a kernel. On the other end, in the world of sparse graphs, and particularly in the world of bounded degree graphs, there is another notion of, uh, of convergence. Why another notion? Because if you pick p random points, uh, vertices, in a huge graph with degree at most d, then almost surely those d points will be very far from each other, so they will induce nothing. There will be no edge. So the first notion will be useless for bounded degrees. Somehow for the first notion to be of uh, meaningful, you will need that your graph is sufficiently dense. So in the second case, instead of picking randomly, of sampling randomly p points in the graph, you only sample one, but you look at a ball, say of radius d, around this vertex. And because your graph has bounded degree, you have only finitely many possible type of balls. 
you have only finitely many graphs with degree d and reduce, uh, reduce some number. So you look at this isomorphism types and you will say that uh, a, a, a sequence of graphs will be local convergent if for every r, integer r, when you sample randomly, uniformly a vertex in your graph and look at the ball of radius r around this vertex, the distribution of the rooted graphs that you can obtain for these balls, this distribution converges. And then, again, you have two possibilities for the limit object. One is to describe it as a distribution, which is called a unimodular distribution. And it is a distribution on the space of uh, uh, rooted, connected, uh, countable graph with uh, bounded degrees, uh, with some uh, invariance properties. And the other possibility is to represent it by an analytic object again, but which now really looks like a graph, and which is called the graphing. Uh, a way to, imagine, to represent what is a graphing is to consider your favorite uh, standard Borel space, say the 0, 1 interval, and to consider D measure preserving involutions. So F1 up to Fd, such that Fi square is identity. So, and then two vertices will be adjacent x and y if f of x is y for some of this function. So, obviously, this defines a graph with maximum degree d. Okay. Let's give some example, some nice example. So, we consider the sequence of graph with uh, maximum degree 2. But uh, to make uh, the, uh, the problem a bit more interesting, we color the vertices into black and red, just to put some, uh, uh, some more uh, difficulties. And I chose uh, the so-called Fibonacci sequence. So the Fibonacci sequence has this property that uh, G6 is obtained by putting one after the other G4 and G5. And so on. And so you see that, uh, well, this doesn't seem to be a really simple uh, sequence. Uh, of course, it is uh, so the repetitions, uh, it does not repeat itself uh, uh, in any way. But, uh, but on the other side, it seems that uh, uh, there is kind of stabilization because each one being the copy of the two previous one, you, if you look at a small neighborhood of a random vertex, somehow you imagine that it will stabilize to some, uh, uh, to some fixed distribution. Okay, this is not clear here, but there is a way to make it more clear. It's to draw this around the circle by well choosing the angle to, uh, to uh, uh, somehow fold the path. And then you see that uh, it is clear that somehow all these blue vertices are together and all the red ones are together. And the limit graphing <coughs> appears very clearly. This will be a graph where two vertices will be adjacent if the angle between them uh, is uh, some uh, prescribed value. And some interval in the circle will correspond to black vertices and the other to red vertices. And here, okay, and, uh, and the fact to, uh, to rotate by some angle is obviously, or to make a symmetry, is, uh, or to rotate by some angle is obviously measure preserving. And moreover, it is clear that the set of edges of your graph will be Borel. It will be nice, a nice measurable subset of, uh, of uh, the, the square of the vertex set. Some other example, so just to, to have some intuition, somehow agreed. If you consider some, some bigger and larger and larger grid, it is clear that if you pick a random vertex and look around at uh, radius d, almost all the vertices see the same thing, a portion of grid. 
uh, you can forget about the one in the periphery. They are only square root of n, so this is small number. The probability to be there goes to zero. And a limit graphing can be obtained like this. Somehow a point will have uh, four adjacencies, so they're obtained by rotating by plus or minus alpha or beta, beta, where alpha and beta are uh, irrational multiple of pi and uh, also not uh, rational uh, multiple of each other. It's easy to see that uh, you will have all the nice properties. And, but it, it looks like somehow you can all, always do it on the circle, but it is not the case. Uh, uh, Sometimes you can have some uh, more uh, strange uh, uh, graphings. And so this is an, another example, which is kind of classical. You consider a sequence of graphs with, say, uh, four regular graphs, but the length of the, mini, uh, of the shortest cycle in your graph goes to infinity. So it is called the girth. So you have a sequence of graphs with higher and higher girths, and, uh, and you want to look at the limit. And again, it is convergent because if you look at the point, somehow in this graph, a random point see something like this. Somehow it, uh, it looks like uh, a beginning of an infinite uh, four regular tree. And uh, which looks uh, quite familiar uh, from other perspective. And somehow you can uh, find a uh, constructor graphing um, by somehow uh, uh, in, uh, in considering uh, on the torus by, uh, by using uh, two uh, rotations that will never interfere in some sense. So, this is a, a well uh, established theory for uh, limits of bounded degree graphs. And the question is, OK, two questions. There are the dense case, the sparse case. First of so all, probably there is a <coughs> kind of change in the behavior of, uh, uh, in the sequences of graphs and the notion of convergence that we can handle. And the second point is, uh, if we want to extend this notion of local limit, which is very nice, uh, to graphs with possibly unbounded degrees, at least uh, uh, asymptotically, we don't want to put any bound on, uh, on the degrees. So how can we do? If we look at isomorphism type, for sure it will not work, because uh, uh, if your degree grow everywhere in your graph, somehow for any fixed graph, the probability that it will be the isomorphism type of, uh, of a ball will go to zero. It will be zero from some stage. So uh, it doesn't behave well. So instead of looking this isomorphism type, one idea, which is maybe more natural uh, today because of the connection with model theory, is, uh, is to look at what are somehow the first order properties of this uh, neighborhood. It's uh, the principle to say that uh, in some sense, like in first so uh, order theory, you have one, two, three, many. So somehow you, up to some number, after some number you don't count anymore. So instead of looking at the isomorphism type, we look at the formulas, the local formulas. So the formulas with a single free variable that are satisfied by the random vertex that we are looking at. And we have that this formula is local. So that somehow it, uh, it looks at uh, something around V. And, uh, and so, we shall say that the sequence is F01 local convergent. So the one stands for one free variable and local, because I, uh, we, we, we consider only local formulas, that is formulas whose satisfaction only depends on the fixed neighborhood of the free variables. And we say that the sequence will be F01 local convergent if the probability that the graph Gn satisfy this formula at a random vertex V, where V is sampled uniformly and uh, uniformly in the graph, 
this probability of satisfaction should converge as n goes to infinity, whatever first or the uh, local formula with a free one free variable I choose. Uh, I, I chose. Okay. So, just a notation I will denote by this strange notation, but at the very end we shall maybe see why this is this notation. Uh, phi Gn, the probability that phi is satisfied in Gn for a random assignment of the free variables, where all the free variables, even if I have more than one, uh, are chosen uniformly and uh, independently at random in the graph. So, this is kind of uh, formal definition of this tone pairing. So, what, ju what I just said. And uh, by, uh, we will consider in the very special case where phi is a sentence. So, where I don't have any free variable. So, in some sense, it's difficult to say that I will assign uh, randomly uh, vertices to the free variables. So, we say simply that it is 0 or 1. 0 whether the sentence is satisfied in Gn, and 1 if, uh, 1 if it is satisfied, and 0 if it is not. Okay. So, you see that in this definition, where I can consider formulas with more than one free variable, of course, not only I can consider formula with more than one free variable, but I don't have to choose local formulas or whatever. I could choose formulas in my favorite uh, fragment of first order logic. And this is somehow the main idea of the general definition of, of a structural limit, is to fix a fragment, x, and usually we'll ask that x has some structure. So somehow that it is a, uh, that it defines a Boolean subalgebra of uh, FO. Uh, just to, to explain why I, I understand FO as a Boolean algebra, uh, for me, the three variables will be fixed, will have fixed name. X1, X2, and so on. Xn. And so, x3 equal x5 is not the same as uh, x5 equal x7, for instance. It's a different, two different formulas. I keep my names. And because I will fix the names of the free variables, I will have a nice uh, Boolean algebra structure. Can you say what a local formula is? Excuse me? What is a local formula? OK, a local formula is a formula whose satisfaction only depends on the fixed neighborhood of the free variables. For instance, I can give you some example. Example of a local formula is, okay, x, the, the distance in the graph between x1 and x2 is at most seven. So it means that I can find at most some points that will connect x1 to x2. Of course, it doesn't only depends on a neighborhood of x1 and x2. And uh, something which is not local is that uh, uh, x1 do, uh, does not belong to a triangle, but there is a triangle somewhere. <laughs> oh, but it depends on g, right? It, it can depend on g. Uh, mm -hmm. the, no, the, the definition of local formula is not, does not depend on g. Well, it's No, I, I want that syntactically, somehow syntactically, uh, I can prove that it only depends on the D neighborhood. So it has to hold, it has to, it has to hold for every graph. And you, you don't fix the radius. The radius can vary. Excuse me? In the definition of uh, first order local convergence, you allow the radius to vary. So you just, it's never fixed. It depends on the standard. Okay, so for instance, in this example, that x1, x2 are distance seven, I can write the formula so that I can prove that it is local. And, uh, and to the opposite, to prove that a formula is, uh, is not local, it's sufficient to find two, uh, two graphs such that 
Uh, the, so for any, any D that I can find two graphs such that the D neighborhood of my vertices V are elementary equivalent, but one satisfies the formula and so the other does not. So some fragments are more interesting than, than others. The first fragment of interest is uh, sentences, which is kind of common. If I only consider sentences, which means that uh, I consider a sequence to be convergent if from some number, any uh, for, such that for any sentence, from one, some number, either all the graphs satisfy the sentence or none do, then uh, of course I, can, I will be able to find some, uh, some nice limit object. This is uh, uh, mm -hmm. more or less uh, the completeness, uh, and compactness and completeness theorem that uh, allow me to uh, I need only compactness. So, and, uh, and uh, if I use a, a, a countable language, which would be always the case here, I can even find some countable, uh, uh, countable model for the limit. Quantifier-free formulas means that I am only able to look at what x1 up to xp, my free variables, induce. What they induce and, and which one are equal to which one. But if I consider graphs with, uh, with order, the number of vertices goes to infinity, the probability that two vertices are equal goes to zero. So it means that only what these vertices, these free variables we induce matters. And in this sense, looking at the probability that the quantifier-free formula will be satisfied by my, my uh, p uh, random vertices is the same as the notion of left limit. If I only consider a single free variable and a local formula, and if I am considering graphs with bounded degree, then the isomorphism type at some, at some uh, radius around the vertex V can be expressed by a, a local formula. And conversely, every local formula with a single free variable reduces to looking at the isomorphism type of ball of some radius because of the locality. Uh, a special case of interest will also be all first order formulas. Maybe I should hurry a bit. Because <sighs> oh. <laughs> okay, modeling. So now we want to have a limit object which, uh, which will generalize the notion of graphing. A graphing, as I said, has a property that the vertex set is a standard Borel space, a nice space like a 0 1 interval, and the edge set is Borel. But when we want to, uh, when we want to consider uh, the, uh, the general cases, it will not be sufficient to have this Borel assumption. Why? Because in the definition of the number of the statistics that we want to converge, uh, there are all the definable sets, or are, are, are there. So if I want to say that whatever phi, the probability that phi is satisfied converges, it means that the measure of the set defined by phi converges to the measure of what phi defines in the limit, so it means that definable sets in the limit should be measurable. And this is why I will ask that my limit object will be totally Borel graph, which means it is a graph on a standard Borel space with the property that every definable set without parameter is Borel. You can put finitely many parameters, it will not change anything. And a modeling will be a totally Borel graph together with a probability measure, uh, with an atomless uh, probability measure on the, uh, on the vertex set. Sorry, what is the structure in which you define a limit set? Excuse me? What, what do you mean by definable? Definable. So this is, if you have a formula phi and you have a structure A, uh, I will simply define phi uh, of A as the set, so let's say that it is phi of x1, xp, it will be the, the set of v1, vp, such that, so say in the graph, so that g satisfies phi of 
V1 VP. It is in V of G, uh, V of G two uh, P. So the language that I use is uh, I use adjacency, which is somehow the language of dwarfs, equality, and all the first order construction, standard first order construction. But this uh, this I will use also for uh, you can use it for relational structure for structures in general, and uh, and actually. Uh, in, in the following, we shall consider not only graphs, but graphs with some uh, unary uh, relations on them, uh, countably many unary relations. OK. So the first thing, the first theorem, is that if you take any F01 local convergent sequence of graphs, then you can construct a modeling that will be uh, the F01 local limit of this sequence of graphs. And uh, here, you, there is no, no question of sparsity or density. And actually, you can ask a bit more. <laughs> Instead of simply looking for local, uh, you can also ask that uh, the sentences, so if it is F01 convergent, then the limit uh, modeling will be an F01 limit. And OK, so the, the last gift is that you can ask even for the last bonus is that if you have not only an F01 convergent sequence of graphs, but also for some formula with more free variables, you want that the limit has a zero non-zero property, that the probability of satisfaction in the limit of uh, modeling will be zero if and only if the limit of the probability of satisfaction in GN is zero. <coughs> and this is what we will denote by GN converges F01 star to L, F01 for first order with one free variable, and star for bonus. And a quick proof, a uh, quick sketch of the proof of this. The first step is <coughs> to find some, uh, some non-standard construction of the limit object, uh, which we obtain by, uh, OK, this is kind of a, a standard ultra product plus some lab measure. Uh, the, the point is that it is absolutely not a standard Borel space. And uh, even the measures, you have some, uh, some number of, uh, of uh, measures which are not really product of each other. So you have some. Uh, but you have some. Uh, it already is quite nice. And it already has the properties that you have some Fubini-like properties that you can somehow in, uh, look, uh, integrate uh, variables by variables, and uh, this will not depend on the order. And then you will only look at some, uh, at some uh, special sentences that you will write not in first order logic, but in an extension which has been proposed by Harvey Friedman, which is a, a QM, LQM logic, where you have some quantifier QM whose intended interpretation is there exists a non-zero measure set such that. And you will not con con consider the full theory of your ultra product, but only, you will only consider this, uh, this sentences which express that uh, if you expect that uh, a probability is uh, greater than zero, it will be greater than zero. And uh, so the, what, is, what are the stone pairings that are zero and what are the stone pairings that are not zero? And, and then using uh, a theorem which has been uh, uh, at least announced by, uh, uh, by Friedman and uh, for which uh, Steinland gave, gave two different proofs, actually. Uh, you, can, you can get that uh, this set of sentences has a totally Borel, uh, Borel model. And uh, why? Because uh, you can prove that uh, uh, because the set of sentences will be consistent because it has some model. More or less, this is the idea. The uh, ultra product is sufficient to give a model. And then you adjust simply the probability measure. And uh, it is not difficult to make it fit for all the, f the first order property, which involve only one free variable. OK. So now we have seen that 
We started from F01 local for bonded degree. And we managed somehow to find a nice F01 star for all graphs. Now, okay, maybe it is, it is possible that it is as much as we can get for all graphs. It is not, we, we don't know for sure. But maybe if we consider some more restricted class of graphs, we can push this F01 star to all FO. So in which case can we find modeling FO limit? What further assumption would we need? So again, we can start from this bonded degree case and remark that for the bonded degree case, it is not difficult to find an FO limit object, which is a graphing. Why? First, because I think considering only one free variable or P free variable doesn't change anything when we have bonded degree. And the reason is that if you pick P free variables, P vertices at random, in a large graph with bonded degree, they are very far from each other. So if your formula only depends on the neighborhood, on the free variables, somehow you can more or less consider independently the types of the free variables, the local types of the free variables, and put all this information together. And from the convergence of all these local types, you will infer that for every local formula, the probability of satisfaction will also converge. And for full FO, you will need to, to do some more trick, which is uh, that uh, in your graphing, you should somehow clean it so that everything that you can find in the, in the graphing, more or less, as a non-zero probability to be there. And so you remove everything else, and you will add to it a countable model of the elementary uh, limit. And this way, you can obtain a graphing, which will be uh, an FO limit of your sequence. So it seems it works for bonded degree, and we want, again, to extend. And the basic idea why it works for bonded degree is that somehow things are very far, random vertices are very far from, from uh, each other on average. This leads to somehow the first idea is to extend this reasoning to the so-called residual sequences, which are sequences of graphs such that if you pick any vertex in your graph and look at a ball of reduced D, then the proportion of vertices that you will find in this ball of reduced D will go to zero when your graph, uh, when, uh, your graph uh, n will go to infinity. So it means that somehow if you have a sequence of graphs which are sufficiently sparse so that no ball of bonded radius will asymptotically contain a positive proportion of all the vertices, then for the same reason, you can find, uh, you will deduce from the general result that, uh, that graphs have FO1 modeling limit, you will deduce that they have actually FO modeling limit. So the question is, how much can you push this? And there is a very nice limit to this uh, process, is that if you have a monotone class of graphs, which, uh, for which you can't find uh, F, uh, modeling F for local limit, then this class has to be nowhere dense. And what is a nowhere dense class of graphs? Well, it's more easy to say what, what is uh, a class which is not nowhere dense. A class of graphs is not nowhere dense if for so some p, you can find arbitrary large cliques subdivided where all the edges are subdivided p times as subgraphs of some graph in your class. So, for instance, if uh, in your graphs you can find graphs with arbitrary large cliques, it is not nowhere dense. If you can find arbitrary one subdivision of cliques, it is not nowhere dense. And these nowhere dense classes have numerous number of uh, characterization. And one of them is that you can make them 
sparse quite easily. So uh, what does it mean? What does it mean? It means that for every D and epsilon, by deleting in the, in the graphs of the class, which is nowhere dense, at most n of D epsilon vertices, uh, you, you, get, you can get a graph where no ball of radius D will contain more than epsilon proportion of all the vertices. So it's almost the same as residual. So you can, you can uh, when you have a class which is nowhere dense, you can make it as close as you want to residual by, uh, uh, by removing a bounded number of vertices. OK. And this leads to easy definition <laughs> of uh, quasi-residual. So let, let's say it uh, intuitively what it means, because otherwise it's uh, not easy to, uh, to read. It means exactly what I said. Uh, a sequence <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> is quasi-residual if whatever distance you choose, and uh, you can, by removing a small subset of vertices, uh, you, can, uh, you can make the ball of reduced D uh, around vertices uh, proportionally as small as you want, and so eventually going to zero measure. And the main point will be to prove that if you have an F4 convergence sequence, which is quasi-residual, uh, quasi then you can find a modeling F4 limit. And it will close the, close the problem in some sense, because every monotone class, a class of graph is nowhere dense, even if every F4 convergence sequence of graphs in it uh, every sequence of it uh, is quasi-residual. So we'll have a, a new characterization of nowhere dense as saying that a monotone class is nowhere dense if and only if every F4 convergence sequence has an F4 limit, uh, modeling limit. OK, so how to prove that under this assumption we can have modeling limits? The main problem here so the main problem here is that to know that uh, in the neighborhood of a vertex we have many vertices, to check this, somehow we need two free variables. We, if you pick two random, we can see that they are close to each other. With a single free variable, it is not easy. And, uh, and the way that uh, to somehow the trick, the main trick is to use countably mini marks to mark all the vertices that, uh, around which we have some concentration, then to mark all the neighbors of, uh, of those vertices, and then to prove some magic property that the F1 star limit, modeling limit of this marked graph will actually be an F4 limit. And to prove this, we do as follow. So it's only a sketch. We do as follow. For any d epsilon, in some sense, we we look at the first marks that uh, will allow to uh, to kill all ball of reduced d containing more than d uh, epsilon proportion of vertices, and we remove the edges by using some interpretation. Interpretation is a way of constructing a new graph from an old graph by using formulas. And the main properties which derive from our notion of convergence is that uh, interpretation, in some sense, behave like continuous function. So if this is convergent to L, and we use this interpretation to delete this, uh, this edges between, uh, between some marks, then by interpretation, we obtain from L a nefo one star limit of this sequence of graphs. And now we use the fact that this is close from being residual, and this also, to prove that, OK, maybe this is not the F4 limit of this, but it is close to it. It is somehow a distance at most epsilon from being the F4 limit of this sequence. But by continuity, we go back, and by interpretation, we can recreate all those edges which we are missing, that we deleted. And because it is also continuous, it proves that L 
is actually some epsilon prime, epsilon prime uh, close from being the FO limit of this. And as it will be true for any epsilon, we can prove that L is actually the FO limit of the sequence. OK. So we have seen that in this proof, in this sketch of proof, <laughs> what is important in some sense are all these marks. All these marks, this, this uh, monadic lift, allowed us to somehow use a, a small fragment of formulas and to get a power of a bigger fragment of formulas. Um, also because we are in a very special classes of graphs, which are, uh, which are the nowhere dense uh, graphs. So the question is, uh, what is the information that we can get from this monadic uh, uh, lift? And, and this goes to the direction of the notion of local global convergence. The notion of local global convergence is, uh, is derived from some work on, uh, by Bolobash and Riordan on, uh, who considered graphs where you add some colors in the, to the vertices and you, instead of looking at uh, the statistics of the, of the neighborhood, you, you look at the colored neighborhood. And um, Atami Lovas and Segedi define the notion of local global convergence sequence of graphs with bounded degree as follows. You consider, you consider uh, some number of, uh, of colors, let's say K. You consider some radius, R. And for your graph GN, you consider all the possible colorings of the vertices of GN by K colors. So uh, you have many, many d uh, different uh, colored uh, version of your graph GN. And, and then, you consider the distribution of uh, the uh, balls of radius R and these graphs. So, you will have, for each coloring of GN, you will have a distribution. So, altogether, you have a set of distributions. And then, you will consider the sequence of a set of distribution. And when you have two sets of distributions, so, this is the set S1, S2. You have two sets of distribution. Then you can define uh, the Hausdorff distance between the two as follow. For every, you pick the worst point distribution in S1, which means that it is farther uh, as possible, uh, as far as possible from points in S2. So you take that, so instance, this is uh, the minimum the maximum over S1 of the distance, minimum distance to S2. And opposite, you take here the worst distribution in S2, and you take the closest distribution in S1. And you take the maximum of S2 values. This is Hausdorff distance between the two, the two. And here, between two distributions, we use, uh, for instance, the total variation distance, which is what it was used. And you would say that the sequence is local global convergent is a sequence of set of distribution converges, or is Cauchy for this Hausdorff distance. It looks strange. It looks strange, but uh, we, can, we can extend this notion. And to extend this notion, we can, we can use some uh, general representation theorem for limits of FO convergence sequences that are, uh, that are that you can represent the limit of an FO convergence sequence by means of a distribution. This somehow extends uh, the results that existed in the, uh, uh, for left limits and local limits. And then, again, what you can do is that you have a sequence of graphs and you will <coughs> consider the set of all colorations and for, to each coloration will correspond a distribution, and you will ask that this distribution converge in Hausdorff uh, distance. And, uh, and this will define local global convergence. The definition by itself is not that intuitive. But there is 
another, an alternative uh, um, definition of this, of, this, uh, of this convergence, which is to say that, okay, you have G1 and you have all the possible coloring of G1. You have G2, all the possible colorings of G2, and so on. So G, GI, GJ, and so on, GN. And assume, so what is local global, uh, global convergence? It says that, assume that you take uh, a sequence of, uh, of colored graphs, but not in all the GI. In, uh, you take a subsequence. So you take one here, one here, one here, so few points. And assume that this sequence is, this sequence, the yellow one, so it is a sequence of colored graphs, is that this sequence is local convergent. So assume that this is convergent. Then local global convergence implies that you can fill the holes. You can simply put some, you can find some uh, coloration for all the other graphs in the sequence in such a way that the full sequence will be local convergent. So blue plus yellow, it is what it means. This local global convergence has nice properties. The first one is that every sequence has a local global convergence subsequence, which is already something nice. And the second property, which has been proved by Atami, Lovas, and Segedi, is that if you consider a sequence, a local global sequence of graphs with bounded degrees, then you have still a nice limit object, and it is a graphing. And uh, this leads us to, to the following problem. Is it possible that if you take a local global convergence sequence of lower dense graphs, it could have a modeling limit. Like, uh, like the result of, uh, of Atami, Lova, Segedi uh, for, for bounded degree. And I will mention some, uh, well, there are some other open problems, but I don't have too, too much time uh, to speak about it. Simply, uh, the first open problem is that uh, what, somehow, what is the limit? It is not really the first one. Somehow, what is the limit, the threshold, for this uh, general uh, modeling limit? We know that every, uh, every F01 star convergence sequence of graphs has a modeling limit, which is for F01 star. For, uh, and we can prove that if we take four free variables, so local formula with four, uh, with, uh, four free variables, there are sequences which are F04 local convergent that do not admit a modeling limit. So what is the biggest fragment of first order for which we can have, in general, a modeling limit? And uh, my personal conjecture is, is that F1 star is, uh, is actually tight. Thank you. Uh, it works, uh, okay, so there are a few things. So the, the, the general theory works well for general structures with countable signature. Uh, and the reason for countable signature is uh, this theorem uh, where we, we need somehow, we use, uh, we use duality and, uh, and, uh, and it needs uh, this structure. But uh, for... Uh, for the nowhere dense part, for modeling part, uh, uh, somehow we, we use some graph, uh, graph notions, so uh, it, it would, would need, up to now, we would need that the Geifman graph is, uh, uh, is uh, nowhere dense, or at least that the class of structure is obtained by interpretation of a class 
uh, where the gauge band graphs is nowhere dense. I'm not sure I... Uh... You can consider a graph form as a convenient function? Oh, yes. Um, here, actually, uh, you can... Uh, hmm. I'm not completely sure on how it, it should be. Uh, somehow you can, you can look at... Uh, here, somehow, the basis of this, uh, of this representation theorem is to consider that uh, you have a, a spatial space, which is a, the, the stone space of your Boolean algebra, and that you are looking, so uh, formulas are somehow embedded as continuous function on this space, and graphs are actually embedded as probability measures, so which means like uh, uh, continuous linear forms on formulas. So, in some sense, <coughs> the part on distribution boils down to uh, 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 Gelfand and Ries uh, duality theorem. Somehow it is a kind of standard thing from, uh, uh, from analysis. So, maybe uh, they could be extended to other settings. So, in a, so th there could be some, uh, some connection to analytic parts. But, uh, but I, so this is the first answer. The second answer is that, but also it is related to, to this, is that uh, when you have this formula, you, for instance, if you say x1 is adjacent to x2, you can look at uh, x1 is adjacent to x2 and x1 is adjacent to x3 and so on. It gives you moments. And, uh, and this way you can somehow co uh, construct kind of sunflowers of formulas and it, and it, uh, it uh, creates a bridge between this uh, formula point of view and, uh, and, fo and Fourier analysis. So. Okay. What, what, would be, what should be a nowhere dense sequence of hypergraphs? Good question. <laughs> this is indeed a good question. We are working on it. <laughs> um, up to now, somehow, uh, and oh, uh, this is one of the two questions, which somehow which are probably uh, related to more dense. The second one is, uh, we consider monotone version. What about non-monotone? Because we like something which would be invariant by interpretation. And up to now, uh, it is not clear exactly what, what would be the, the limit, but it seems that, uh, so what we know is that every a class of graphs which is interpretation of nowhere dance is monadically stable. This is the first point. And the second point we know, uh, we know that it has uh, the, know the value of the VC densities of formulas. Mm -hmm. And it's maybe, maybe it is, uh, it is if and only if, but uh, we, we cannot prove it yet. If yes, it would give the answer because it would somehow uh, be completely uh, syntactic. Uh, <laughs> Absolute formulation. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> 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 <laughs>